I just want to start by saying that I am really happy to be here and that I hope I can see that the conference is already a huge success. And so I wish this is just uh, the first of many. Thank you so much. My name is Melissa. Uh, I am based in Brazil. I am a software engineer at Quantsite for the moment. Uh, I have worked as a professor in the university here in Brazil in the past, but now I'm working at Quantsite developing uh, some open source solutions for uh, clients interested in data science, machine learning, and other um, numerical solutions using open source projects. And in particular, I'm working on NumPy, um, on F2Py, and also working on the documentation side of NumPy. And Piaru Peterson, who is the original author of the F2Py tool, is my colleague there. So I'm sure all of you have seen programming experience and expertise. This makes it a good choice for scientists sometimes who are not necessarily trained in programming or computer science, but need to use scientific code in their research. In addition, there's a large ecosystem of packages um, that has developed around it, powered by a real open source community. So what does that mean? It means that there's a lot of documentation, online forums where users can talk to each other and ask questions. There are many, many conferences organized around the Python language and the other standard libraries and the other added libraries. Uh, there are many locally organized user groups and there's a sense of governance in the sense that there's a structure and organization to most of these communities. Uh, these local groups have split up in many different kinds of groups. So there's uh, PyData, there's a lot of other uh, groups focused on web programming, there's PyLadies, there's AfroPython, there's a lot of diversity and inclusion efforts. And this means that the community is able to um, embrace a large number of people. So, since many scientists started using Python, there has been a big scientific ecosystem developed around it. So it, Python by itself has no fast array computing capabilities or linear algebra tools, but then the so-called SciPy ecosystem has developed as an answer to that. It contains SciPy, which is the main scientific library containing most tools for scientific data, uh, including statistics, linear algebra, and numerical optimization, and other tools. There's matplotlib, which is the main plotting package that we all use to make uh, plots for our numerical methods. I'm assuming most of you have used matplotlib before if you know Python. And uh, in the bottom of all that, there's NumPy. So, there are also other high-level packages such as SymPy and Pandas and uh, the IPython console along with Jupyter Notebooks, for example. But the base of it is NumPy, which is the fundamental package for numerical computation in Python. It includes fast multidimensional array manipulation, uh, packages, uh, sub-packages for fast Fourier trans transforms, random number generation, masked arrays, and Fortran interoperability through F2Py. However, there are applications for which this is not enough. So just using NumPy, uh, the standard NumPy, SumPy, sometimes it's not enough for the speed that we would like to have in our code or uh, the, the capability of treating large uh, amounts of data. So that's why we have F2Py. F2Py started as an attempt to glue fast Fortran code with flexible Python code and enable high level features such as interactivity and plotting to existing research code written in Fortran. As we all know, there is a, a huge a number of um, legacy codes and legacy projects already written in Fortran, 
which are tried and tested and uh, which are being used by research groups and by engineering groups and by many people in the industry for a long time and maybe they don't want to rewrite all that code in another language but just be able to interface it with another one. F2Py can be used as a command line tool or as a module inside of NumPy. It is a dependency for many important projects, including the SciPy library itself, and it can be used to wrap Fortran or C code. It is now a part of NumPy, so it, create, it works by creating extension modules that can be imported in Python as regular Python modules. So how does it work? Since this is a 15 minute presentation, I am not going to show you huge examples or explain in details how the, the, the technique works, but the basics of it are the following. Whenever you have your source for trend code, let's uh, call it source.f90, you have a module with a subroutine and you want to wrap this in Python, Theoretically, all you have to do is run f2py and compile it and into a submodule that you are going to import into Python. Here I'm calling it Fortran. After this, I would come into the, for example, this is the IPython console, but you can do this inside the Jupyter Notebook or inside your regular Python console. And you would import this module Fortran containing all your Fortran subroutines. So you can see I am here calling the module Fortran. Inside this wrapped module, there is the original Fortran module that I have created in the source.f90 file. It is called f module. And inside f module, there's a subroutine called fast reverse. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm calling this subroutine in a numpy array which is an array of uh, floats that I have created from Python. And the result is the modified array A. So you can see that I have inverted or reversed the first two items in this uh, array using Fortran. So this is a simple code. And if you have more complicated code, you can include other options as well. For example, in this code, this is the same as before, but this time I am including an f2py directive. So this is a comment in my Fortran code, and I am telling f2py to check at runtime that the length of a is larger than n, which is the number of elements I want to reverse. Otherwise, I can have problems. And so what this does when you compile it using f2py again is the same, um, the same command, importing this module into Fortran. If I try to run this module uh, with a different argument, so if I try to do it with a four, I'm sorry, there's a typo here, this should be a four. Um, uh, you can't reverse a four elements in a three element array. And so it will give you an error. It will check for your arguments to see if they make sense. There are also many other options that you can include using F2Py directives, but sometimes this is not possible. So maybe your code can't be modified or you have too many source, codes, uh, source code files in Fortran and you don't want to change each one of them by hand. And so maybe you want to generate a header file. So a header file is, uh, has an extension PYF. And inside this header file, what you do is describe the interface to your Fortran routines so that F2Py knows how to treat each argument, what to check, and how to uh, expose this to Python. So this is a very simple header file. You can see it has a kind of syntax similar to what you would see in, for in Fortran. However, you can include many options like the check I showed you before or like a intent hide, for example, when you don't want to show to expose this um, 
this component to Python, or you can define callbacks, and I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, that in, in the following slides. But the idea of having header files is that you can see the interface and control how you interface Fortran and Python code um, without modifying your original Fortran files. So who uses F2Py? Right now, there are a number of different projects that are using F2Py. The largest one, I would say, or maybe the most impactful one is SciPy. So SciPy itself has a lot of Fortran code inside it, especially in the numerical optimization and numerical linear algebra sub-libraries. And so you can see, for example, here in the figure, there's a bunch of F2Py directives inside the code for computing the determinant of a mat matrix in SciPy. So this means that F2Py, uh, as much as it's a sometimes invisible project because it is a part of NumPy, it is extremely important to maintain the whole scientific Python ecosystem because many downstream libraries depend on it. There are also other independent projects that use F2Py. For example, there's CPy, which is a state estimation and analysis in Python and it has tools for working with ocean models and data. WRF Python, which is a collection of diagnostic and interpolation routines for use with output from the weather research and forecasting model in climate science. There is Slycot, which is a Python wrapper for selected routines in systems and control theory. There's PyHip, used as a pre-processing step in the geometry and mesh creation process prior to an optimization and many, many other projects um, that depend on F2Py. What are the current features of F2Py? So right now, uh, F2Py supports calling Fortran 77, 90 and 95 partially and C functions from Python. So not all features from Fortran 90 and 95 are supported. It can access some Fortran data from Python and can also do callbacks. So this means you can call Python functions from Fortran and C. So for example, you can pass a Python function as an argument to a Fortran subroutine. It generates basic documentation strings for the wrapped functions and modules and can also wrap uh, C libraries. Um, F2Py currently works, uh, the architecture of the project means that we are parsing the interface for each subroutine and function and trying to figure out how to translate each uh, component from Fortran to a C extension for Python. This means that we have to be very careful about parsing all the different components. And for this reason, there are some features from Fortran that are not supported. So for example, support for Fortran 95 and up is not complete at all. Uh, derived types and Fortran pointers are not supported at this moment. There is a great need to improve the character and string array support. Uh, this is from the time when NumPy didn't have Unicode string support, so we still need to fix that. Uh, F2Py needs maintenance, so there has been quite some time for which F2Py has had no official maintainer, and this has caused some regressions, and uh, this needs fixing. And finally, we need to improve the documentation. So some of the features of F2Py are not detailed in the documentation, um, and many issues, for example, file to the NumPy repo end up being a problem with uh, people not having access to the complete documentation of F2Py. So finally, what are the next steps? Uh, I am here also because this is a call for contributions. If you think you can contribute to the project, you are very welcome. Um, we would like to include support for modern Fortran in F2Py and we can see that the Fortran Lang community is growing. Um, and so this would be a good opportunity to uh, make uh, contact between the Python and the Fortran community so that we can improve together. 
Finally, uh, it would be great to have better integration with other tools and compilers and uh, to have support from packages that use F2Py as a dependency, uh, even if it is issuing bug reports. This is also important so we can know in which direction to go. Thank you very much. Um, I can answer whatever questions you have. Although I am not exactly the expert, the expert is Piaru, but I hope I can answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, there are, in fact, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I will not be able to ask all of those. I can start. Um, one first question is, we have seen that you can introduce um, specific F2Py checks, which are probably executed. Are they executed on the Fortran side in the end or on the Python side, those F2Py checks? Let's, let's start with that. So um, the check, in this case, the check is, uh, since it is executed in runtime, it is executed uh, in the C extension. I would guess, uh, I am actually not sure about that now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but the idea is just to have more information about what to do with that. Of course, there are some compilers that will uh, tell you stuff like that before. And uh, it, those checks, actually the check I showed you is automatic for F2Py. You wouldn't even have to include it. I just included it to show like the, the syntax of it. But the idea is, uh, uh, I actually don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that right now. Right. No problem. 